Hi, I'm Professor Sturm. In previous videos, you learned about the importance of being familiar with anatomical position and anatomical terminology so that in a medical setting you can communicate with other healthcare professionals. In addition to knowing anatomical terms and positions, it's important to have a good working understanding of the organs inside of the body as well as how those organs are oriented. When we look inside the human body, it's not completely dense with material. It has hollow cavities that contain additional organs within them. And we call those body cavities. Make sure as I'm going through this video that you're looking along in either your lab manual or your lecture textbook. In some cases the lecture textbook might be more thorough. Make sure you have a good uh, resource to follow along. When we look at these cavities within the human body, we can grossly subdivide them into an anterior cavity on the anterior side of the body that contains the thoracic cavity as well as the abdominal pelvic cavity. We also have a posterior cavity that contains the cranial cavity as well as your vertebral cavity. If we look at the posterior cavity and look at the cranial cavity, you have your brain in the cranial cavity and you have your spinal cord uh, going through the vertebral cavity. When we look on the anterior cavity, we can subdivide it into the thoracic, which is separated from the abdominal pelvic from an organ known as the diaphragm. When you go inferior to the diaphragm, you get into the abdominal pelvic cavity as well, well, I'm sorry, the abdominal pelvic cavity which can be subdivided into the abdominal region or abdominal cavity as well as the pelvic cavity. The difference here is that the abdominal pelvic cavity, those cavities are not physically divided by any particular one structure that cuts them into two separate cavities. It's more of a conceptual uh, differentiation than the physical differentiation between the thoracic and the abdominal pelvic cavity. If you're thinking to yourself, what types of material on here will be important for testing or how will I be tested on such material, we will expect you to be able to, if we give you an organ, we would want you to know what cavity that it's in. So as you're following along, make sure that you think about which cavities I'm sorry, which organs fall into each one of your cavities. So when we're talking about the thoracic cavity, you have your lungs and your heart and your esophagus and your trachea. When you go down to the abdominal pelvic cavity, you have your liver, you have small intestines, large intestines, you have urinary bladder. So follow along, make sure that you know where these organs are located. When we look at these organs, one of the, the functions of these cavities is the organs within each cavity have a series of membranes that, you have two membranes that have fluid in between the membranes. So if we go to the thoracic cavity and we look at the lungs specifically, the lungs are surrounded by two membranes. You have one membrane touching the viscera or the organs, meaning the lungs specifically, and you have another membrane that is touching the body wall or more superficially located. So the membrane that is touching the viscera or the organ is referred to as the visceral membrane. And when we're talking about the lungs, they're within a subdivision of the thoracic cavity known as the pleura. So we have a visceral pleura that's touching the lungs and then we have serous fluid and we have a parietal pleura that is touching the body wall. The serous fluid is functioning to minimize friction and allow these organs to move, uh, have a certain degree of motion with inside this cavity so that if you, you, know, you come to a, an abrupt stop and these organs want to move due to, say, the law of inertia, you have a little bit of a buffer with that serous fluid in between um, the two membranes. When we look uh, 
Between the two lungs, we have a subdivision of the thoracic region known as the mediastinum. The mediastinum connects the posterior aspect of the sternum to the anterior aspect of the, uh, of the vertebrae, and it spans from rib number one all the way down to the diaphragm. So in that centrally located subdivision, that area is known as the mediastinum, and within the mediastinum you have another cavity called the pericardial cavity. Once again, we have two membranes surrounding the heart within the pericardial cavity, so we have a visceral pericardium touching the heart, then we have superficial to that we have serous fluid, and then superficial to that we have a parietal pericardium. When we go down to the abdominal pelvic cavity, instead of a visceral and parietal pleura, we have a visceral and parietal peritoneum. The membranes, the serous membranes inside the abdominal pelvic cavity are referred to as peritoneum. So if I had a, a knife wound to my abdominal pelvic cavity or, or a bullet wound to my abdominal pelvic cavity, the order that the bullet or the knife would penetrate would be, initially it would penetrate through the parietal peritoneum and then through the serous fluid into the visceral peritoneum and then into any, um, any vital organs that are uh, unfortunate to be behind that area. Don't forget to take your quiz and blackboard over the material that we're covering and don't forget that even though there are classes in college you may end up taking where you may ask the question, why do I even need to know this stuff? Even if you decide to change directions in your college career, you're probably still going to have a human body. When I think of anatomy and physiology, I think of this as one of those classes that's kind of like a user manual for your body. Most of us have loved ones, and if you don't, you should get some. But Anytime you have a loved one that has some sort of an issue that causes them to have to seek medical attention, you want to be familiar so that when you want to ask a question to a physician, you can kind of understand some of these terms and you have a basic working knowledge of when they say a particular organ, you're thinking of the right area. And uh, it, it just makes for uh, being able to ask better questions and probably get a little bit better um, understanding of what's causing the problem and possibly how you can maybe even solve the problem without having to seek medical uh, help. So. Hi, welcome back. In, previous, in a previous video, uh, you learned about the body cavities within the human body as well as organs that are located inside those cavities. Unfortunately, sometimes medical professionals have to perform some sort of a task where they have to do an invasive surgery and they have to cut into the body and modify an organ or remove an organ and for that reason it is important to not just know that an organ is in the abdominal region but where in the abdominal region it falls. One thing I want to point out uh, when you think about anatomical position I want to make sure that you know that any time we refer to a, a right or a left on any patient, we are always referring to the patient's right or the patient's left. Um, the reason being is that the patient's right will always stay the patient's right, even if you flip them into a prone position or a supine position, the patient's right is always the patient's right. So keep that in mind. I've had semesters in the past where we get to the first lab practical and I have a question that you know, uses the term right or left and the student will raise their hand and I come check on them and they say, do you mean the patient's right? And I say, do I? And then that's all I give them for an answer because I'm expecting them to already know at that point that anytime we use right or left, we're referring to the patient's right or left. So if you look in your book and follow along, you'll see that there's a couple different um, methods for subdividing the abdominal regions. If you look, one way to define or to subdivide the abdominal region is to make a tic-tac-toe board across the abdominal region and in the center square of the tic-tac-toe board you have the umbilical region. If we look directly superior to that box 
you would have the epigastric region, epi meaning on or upon, and gastric referring to the stomach. So the epigastric region is approximately on or upon the stomach. Um, if you look at the stomach, it, 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 does, it, it kind of originates more on the left-hand side of the body and then goes through that epigastric region, but we, we would say that's the epigastric region. If you look at the uh, box directly inferior to the umbilical region, you'll notice the hypogastric region. So hypo meaning below, just like hypoactivity would be not very active, or hypoglycemic meaning low blood sugar. So hypogastric meaning well below the gastric region. When I first saw this tic-tac-toe board, it seemed somewhat overwhelming, but when you kind of take the time to really analyze it, it's really not too hard. If you look at the, the patient's right and the patient's left-hand side of this tic-tac-toe board, you'll notice they're basically identical. You just have a right and left for each one of these. So I like to start with the lumbar region. So if you go to the umbilical region and go directly right and left, you have a right lumbar region and a, right, and a left lumbar region. Then if you go superior to the right and left lumbar region, you will see a right hypochondriac region and a left hypochondriac region. Now, I joke with my students sometimes about hypochondriacs thinking that they're sick, and so I, I think about somebody that comes in and goes, oh, I've got a I've got uh, liver cancer, or oh, I've got a stomach ache, uh, you know, because they're a hypochondriac. But uh, chondro also means cartilage, and so you have uh, cartilage with the ribs called costal cartilage that helps the ribs articulate with the sternum, and if you go right below that area, you would have the hypochondriac region. If we go way to the bottom, you will see that below the right and left lumbar regions, you have a right and left inguinal region or a right and left iliac region. Uh, inguinal referring to the groin or iliac referring to the ilium of the pelvis. So that's the more complex way of subdividing. You can get a little bit more detailed that way, but uh, another method that's uh, often used in healthcare is to take the uh, abdominal region and cut it into four quadrants. And this one's fairly easy. It probably won't require much memorization at all because you can just say you have a right upper quadrant, a right lower quadrant, a left upper quadrant, and a left lower quadrant. And so always the patient's left, always the patient's right. And anytime we use anatomical terms, we're always assuming anatomical position. Don't forget that. You live in an age where you have an abundance of resources at your fingertips typically to supplement your textbook while trying to learn anatomy and physiology. Most of my students that aren't successful aren't unsuccessful because they have a shortage of resources, it's just they're not sure how to utilize the resources that they have. Prior to having this information age, one of the ways that humans would learn about human anatomy and physiology is they would actually cut humans up. A lot of the times the humans were dead, but not always. Modern imaging techniques allow us to cut the body uh, without actually physically cutting the body so that we can see what's inside the body without uh, doing any trauma to the body. So when you look at an MRI or an X-ray or a CAT scan or a PET scan, the, the image that you're looking at should be able to be classified as to what angle it's cutting through the body. And so we need to learn about what we call body planes. So if we were to physically cut the body or just use an imaging technique to cut the body, if we cut through the body such that we end up separating the body into a right portion and a left portion, that's known as a sagittal section. If we cut through the body so that we get a right half and a left half, if we go directly through the middle, that's known as a mid-sagittal section. If we go out laterally, either right or left, we're always referring to the patient's right or left, then we would call that a parasagittal section. So I want you to think for a moment 
How many mid-sagittal sections could you possibly make through a human body? Or how many different ways could you make a mid-sagittal section? If you're thinking correctly, you should be thinking, if it's truly mid-sagittal, there's only one way to do that. Okay? If I asked you, on the other hand, how many ways can you make a parasagittal section, you should be thinking, depending on how thinly you can cut, you could hypothetically make infinite number of parasagittal sections. So, anytime we separate the body into a right and left portion, that is a mid-sagittal section. If we cut the body such that we have an anterior portion of the body and a posterior portion, like if I were to cut right through where my belt line is, that can be referred to as a transverse section because it's going side to side, or we can also call it a cross section. You may wonder, well, do I need to know both terms? Depending on which healthcare professionals you work with depends on what their favorite term to use is, and so yes, you should know both terms. When we look at cutting the body in a way that you have an anterior portion falling forward and a posterior portion falling posterior, we can call that a coronal or frontal section. So when I think of that, if I cut so that part of the body falls front, that's a frontal section. And another way that I memorize this is when I'm talking about a coronal section, I picture myself just like the corona commercial on a beach with two coronas, one in each hand, and I'm holding them kind of in this weird fashion only because if I hold them side by side then that wouldn't work for my scenario. The only section that I can pass through the body and end up piercing both of these bottles would be a coronal section or another section I'm about to tell you about called an oblique section. So. If I cut the body such that you have an anterior portion and a posterior portion, that is a coronal or frontal section, any body planes that pass through the body in any direction that's not one of the previously mentioned sections, we can refer to those as an oblique section, meaning it's going kind of at an angle diagonally across the body. So you can have many different oblique sections and uh, as you can have many different oblique sections that I was going to mention. You know, later on when we get to your muscles, you'll, you'll notice that we use the term oblique to refer to your external obliques because of the direction the fibers run. They run in an oblique direction. So, uh, make sure you're following along in the book, and uh, both the lecture and lab textbooks, and make sure that you don't neglect to take the quizzes and blackboard over the material. And remember that your instructors do have office hours and sometimes you struggle with the material. We are not mind readers. If you don't come see us and let us know, we just assume that you're not struggling with the material. So make sure you use all your resources at your disposal, including your instructor. Thank you.